right, thanks for attending this recorded talk. Uh, looking forward to your comments. Uh, so let's just get right into it. So my talk is on acting together, the obligation criterion and reduction. What I'm gonna do in this talk is I'm mostly gonna engage with the work of Margaret Gilbert, who's argued extensively against reductionism um, or the claim that in her own words, that acting together is ultimately composed of the thoughts, attitudes, actions, and so on of individual persons. And the, Gilbert thinks this for different reasons. She has different arguments. But one of her arguments against this is that acting together essentially involves a system of rights between the participants. So I have three aims in this talk. The first is to explain why I think Gilbert's claim is equivocal um, between a strong and a weak reading. And then I'm gonna argue that the strong reading is implausible and the weak reading is compatible with reductionism and also I think is implausible. Um, so if acting together is irreducible, where I'm taking the reducibility claim to be this quotation from Gilbert's above, it's not because acting together essentially involves a system of rights. And then the third thing I'm gonna do is offer a proposal that tries to preserve the kernel of truth in Gilbert's account, because I think she's on something really important, um, but in a way that's consistent with reductionism. Okay, so briefly, what is acting together? Uh, here are my assumptions. I'm thinking that action is to be understood in terms of intentional action, and that intentional action is to be understood in terms of guidance by the attitude and intention. Uh, so acting together is to be understood in terms of a group's guidance by a collective intention, analogous to the way that individual action is to be understood in terms of guidance by an individual intention. So a collective intention, I mean, what is that? Uh, I take it to be a collective goal uh, or an aim or an end. I take these to be synonymous. If this serves as a settled objective for a group, it provides a standard of success that shapes the mental and physical actions of the participants in ways that realize um, the characteristic functions of intentions. I'm thinking of intentions as a state as functionally defined um, and very roughly, in, the functional profile of intentions involve um, a disposition to promote or bring about, excuse me, the object um, of the intention, the aim, the end, or the goal. But they also involve uh, acceptance of and guidance by certain norms, what Michael Bradman calls norms of plan rationality, so things like means and coherence, plan consistency, uh, belief, intention consistency, uh, st stability over time, things like this. So, so just summing up kind of what, we, what I just said. So acting together, I take to be collective guidance by collective intention. And in turn, I take a group to have a collective intention when the group realizes the characteristic functional profile of intentions. But when is that? And the question here is, can we construct a collective intention? Can we instantiate the relevant functional profile from the interrelated thoughts, attitudes, and actions of the individuals, which is what I take the reductionist to be claiming, um, that is, is acting together, can we explain it in terms of, ultimately explain it in terms of uh, the thoughts, attitudes, and actions, and so on of individual persons or not, um, as the, the non-reductionist claims like Gilbert. Okay, so according to Gilbert, at the core of acting together, as well as other important social phenomena, is this idea of a joint commitment. And a group of individuals is jointly committed to sigh when they are committed or bound to emulate a single body or person that sighs. Right, and where psi could be in 10 to phi, for example, and that's gonna be the relevant case. So, so joint commitment's a more general idea, but the idea of a, of a collective intention and therefore of uh, acting together kind of falls out of it. So I'm, I'm focused on that case, but the idea of joint commitment is, is broader than that. And in Gilbert too, joint commitment is, is irreducible. So why does she think that joint commitment is, is irreducible? Well, like I said, there are, she has you know different reasons, different arguments for thinking this. I'm just focusing on one. Um, but according to Gilbert, it's essential to a joint commitment that it obligates the parties one to the other. So there are these directed um, obligations to act in accordance with the commitment. So each, each of the parties owes such action to the others. They owe each other to, to play their respective parts. And they have various sort of entitlements to, to monitor and enforce, um, you know, each playing, each playing one's part. And they're entitled to, to rebuke or chide, as Gilbert puts it, um, one another for non-performance. And I, the way I would like to think about this is just in terms of holding responsible. So I think this isn't the way that Gilbert 
puts it, but I think the gloss that I'd like to put on it is that what's essential to joint commitment is that there's a system of rights or mutual entitlements. I take rights and entitlements to be synonymous that, that constitutes a system for judging and holding one another responsible. It gives one another entitlements to say monitor um, and enforce one another and certain conduct from each other in order to promote the, the goal that the, the group is organized around. So the idea here is that uh, the parties to a joint commitment and therefore um, acting together, something that's essential to it is, is being bound together. The participants are bound together in a nexus of rights. Um, and that's, that's crucial. Uh, so like I just said, uh, joint commitment and so collective intention and so acting together, it's constituted in part by a system of rights. And the thought here, Gilbert's thought seems to be something like, well, acting together or joint commitment can't be reduced because the rights can't be reduced. So if, if joint commitment essentially involves a system of rights and the system of rights can't be ultimately composed of the thoughts, attitudes and actions of the individuals, then the joint commitment can't be so reduced. So I take that to be the thought. Okay, so now I wanna to turn to disambiguating Gilbert's claims. So the kind of thesis is that joint commitment essentially involves a system of rights. And I think that there's a stronger reading, reading and a weaker reading. So I'm just gonna lay them out first and then I'm gonna explain each in more detail. So in the strong reading, it's essential to acting together um, because it's essential to joint commitment that participants are bound together in a nexus of genuine mutual entitlements. And I'll say a little bit more about what genuine means shortly. On the weaker reading, what's essential is that the participants think that they're bound together in a nexus of genuine mutual entitlements in a way that's out in the open between them. Okay, so the strong interpretation. So often Gilbert insists that the obligations of the type in question are genuine in the sense that if one has a genuine obligation to do a certain thing, one that has a sufficient reason to do that thing, or that all else being equal, a given party will not act as he ought should he fail to respect their obligations in an unqualified sense of ought. So in a sort of flat out sense, the sense that's at the center of ethics um, that moral philosophers are interested in when they study what to do or how to live. Um, but I think the strong interpretation has problems, a lot of which I take to be familiar. So there's no restrictions or you know, there's not many restrictions on the um, content of a shared intention or collective intention. So agents could, you know, intend to destroy the world. They could work together to destroy the world or to do something completely pointless or worthless, like counting blades of grass or eating saucers of mud. And for Gilbert, the, the reasons or the obligations that the participants get, they get simply in virtue of it being a shared activity. It doesn't matter what the content is. So the content could be as evil or malicious as you like, or as worthless or as pointless as you like, and you would still get genuine reasons and obligations on the strong view, on the strong interpretation of the system of rights that's involved in acting together. But why think that? I mean, why think that joint commitments as such entail substantive ethical commitments about what to do, how to live, what, that, what why think that joint commitment as such involves a substantive view about what would answer the question of like how to live or what to do? So the thought I'm trying to bring out here is that well, social ontology is one thing, characterizing the social world is one thing, and the eth ethical significance or lack thereof is another thing. And I'm unsure why we need to commit to substantive views and ethics in the way that Gilbert's view on the strong interpretation seems to, in order to characterize what it is to act together. So Gilbert has reasons for thinking that joint commitments genuinely give you reasons or obligations because she thinks that uh, commitments as such are reason giving. And I worry about that argument. I think it faces a kind of bootstrapping objection, which I'm not gonna talk about, but I mention it because I'd be happy to talk about it in the Q and A. But here's another argument why I think the strong interpretation is too, is too strong. So assume that acting together involves uh, mutual entitlements of the genuine variety as the strong interpretation claims. Okay, well, uh, you know, acting together, that's a real thing that happens in the world. It's a real phenomenon, so it exists. Okay, it's possible 
that some kind of nihilism is true, such that there are no genuine entitlements at all. So given the assumptions, it's possible that there both are and aren't substantive entitlements, contradiction. Okay, so the idea here, just kind of summing it up in different words, is that even if some sort of normative nihilism were true, there would still be social phenomena, such as acting together. So whatever theoretical resources we need to explain the social phenomena, I don't think we need to lean so heavily on substantive ethical commitments about what we genuinely have reason or have obligations um, to do. Okay, so then there's the weak interpretation, which Gilbert also uh, seems to go in for at certain points. So sometimes she distances herself from the strong interpretation. So for example, in one of her papers, she's replying to an objection from Michael Bratman and to put my gloss on it, that agents can't have ethically substantive obligations to promote an evil or worthless collective intention. And then Gilbert writes, yet those who share intentions to do bad things may well think otherwise. But that's not the same thing as saying that they really do have the entitlements. It's just saying that they think that they do. And likewise, in the discussion about the standing that participants have with respect to one another, Gilbert writes that she's focused on the beliefs of the parties as to their standing in relation to one another, not on what standing they in fact have. So there are points in her writing where she seems like she's going in for this weaker interpretation. So the weaker interpretation um, really just involves the participants' beliefs or what they think. It's about their own attitudes about what sort of rights they're, they're bound together um, bound together with. But then if, if that's the view, I don't see why it's incompatible with a kind of reductionism where that means that shared uh, or collective intentions can ultimately be explained in terms of the thoughts and attitudes and actions of the individuals because that's all we've appealed to on the weak interpretation. So I don't really see, that's not an objection to the weak interpretation, it's just an objection to Gilbert's using joint commitment on the weak interpretation to militate against reductionism. So I don't think that that works. But in any case, I, I think the weak interpretation is too weak for the simple reason I think we can have rights that we don't think we have. So here's the kind of simple toy example. Um, if you're playing chess and if you're new to chess, you might not realize that you're entitled to en passant in certain situations. But even though you don't think that you are because you don't even know what an en passant is, um, you do have an entitlement to do it, right? So you can have entitlements that you don't think that you have, for example, when you're new to chess and you're playing chess. Okay, so summing up the discussion so far, um, Gilbert claims that joint commitment and so collective intention and so acting together essentially involves a system of rights that bind the participants together. But that claim is equivocal between a strong and a weak reading, each of which she suggests at different times in her work. But in any case, kind of both interpretations face challenges. Um, and so I wanna motivate the search for an alternate, an alternate way um, of proceeding that kind of preserves the kernel of truth in Gilbert's account. Cause I think she's really onto something, but, I, but we need to avoid the preceding objections. And it would be nice if it were consistent with um, reductionism in, in my view. Um, so I wanna suggest that we invoke this idea of appropriateness. Um, so instead of insisting that there are essentially genuine rights binding participants together, but without retreating to just saying what the participants think, what rights they think, excuse me, what rights they think they have, we can say that the nexus of entitlements that's involved in trade agency, it makes certain responses to one another appropriate or inappropriate, according to the internal logic of the activity. And what I mean here is um, something like the way in which games have internal logics. They, internal to the game, there are certain things that you can or can't do, or um, certain responses are appropriate or inappropriate, but there might not be any reason really to play the game or that the rights that the game specifies might not be genuine in any sort of sense. So, What's appealing about this move is that on the one hand, the fact that some response is appropriate according to the internal logic of some activity doesn't entail that there are genuine reasons or rights or any other substantive ethical notions. 
so we can just avoid the pitfalls of the strong interpretation. On the other hand, according to a certain way of thinking about norms, um, namely a certain Strassonian way, which I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A, certain genuine norms, genuine rights, genuine um, entitlements, they are constituted by the appropriateness of certain attitudes and behaviors, uh, namely reactive attitudes, but maybe also others. So, it, so the idea is that um, appropriateness doesn't entail substantive ethical conclusions, but it also makes room for it insofar as you're willing to go in for a certain kind of roughly Strassonian view, which again, I'm happy to talk more about in the Q&A. And that's the way in which it kind of gives us some flexibility, can preserve the kernel of truth, but it can avoid um, both problems. So, but the idea is that on the Strassonian view, so even if you go in for this alternate way of thinking about things, even when there are genuine rights, uh, sort of really, there are entitlements between the participants, they themselves will be composed of the attitudes and the behaviors of individuals and what makes them appropriate. So again, you get a kind of consistency with a reductionist um, view. So just to, to put all three views on the table at once, emphasizing what I'll call the medium view just offered, is that it's essential to acting together um, that participants are bound together in an excess of mutual entitlements, just strike through the, the genuine, where the mutual entitlements are gonna be unpacked in terms of appropriateness, and those don't entail anything about genuineness, um, but in certain cases, they may very well be genuine. Um, so the appeal of this approach, in short, is that appropriateness allows us to characterize the rights that are purportedly constitutive of shared agency without making substantive ethical commitments but also allowing for the possibility that there are substantive, um, substantive ethical ideas lurking here, at least in particular cases, but in also in a way that's at least potentially consistent with reductionism. Okay, so just summing up the, the whole talk. So Gilbert has argued extensively against reductionism or this idea that acting together is ultimately composed of the thoughts, attitudes, actions, and so on of individual persons in part on the grounds that action together implicates a system of rights. But that claim is ambiguous between a strong and a weak interpretation. The strong interpretation is implausible, I think. It's, for example, subject to the, what I called the argument from the possibility of nihilism. On the other hand, the weak interpretation is consistent with reductionism, but it's also implausible, I think, because we can have rights that we don't think we have. And I've suggested that maybe we could go in for a medium view spelled out in terms of appropriateness, maybe that would do better, but that's also consistent with reductionism. So kind of anywhere we, any, any way we try to go, either the view is too strong and just not plausible, or it, it's maybe plausible, but then it's not inconsistent with kind of broad reductionism. So the kind of overall conclusion is that, well, if acting together is irreducible, it's not because it involves a system of rights. So I haven't argued that acting together is reducible. I've just argued that if it's not reducible, it's not irreducible for this reason. So thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A and getting your feedback and, and uh, trying to make this um, better.